afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to the people that is waiting for the speech from Professor Rao, uh, Rao from Norwegian University uh, of Science and Technology. Uh, we would like to give all our, our uh, satisfaction to receive you, Professor Rao, uh, Rao in our uh, meeting, international meeting. The, uh, the IEP, Instituto de Engenharia de pa do Paraná, has a, a lot of speeches in the next days. One of the, the, the speech is about the 5.0 technology in telecommunication. Yeah. And we have a, a, a meeting for a student next month, August, August, August month, uh, from the day 16 to 19, where we have a three more international speech. One is from uh, NASA, from the USA. A scientist from there will explain our the exploration from the March uh, uh, planet. Second, we have a, a speech from BIM, Bean, from Professor Ralph, Ralph Sachs, Raphael Sachs from Israel. And uh, Another one speech from a, a, our member that is doing a postdoc in Boston, University, Harvard University, about the new car, electric cars in the urban, urban area. Uh, that's it. So, with this uh, mix of uh, speech, that we have in, in our institute. We have, a, we can uh, give it to all the different engineers, uh, formation, specialized, all the, the, the opportunity to change experience and create a network of uh, knowledge. That is the main object of our institute. With this word, I give you uh, our best regard from uh, come to us, and I give uh, the control of the speech of this presentation to Mr. Rodrigo Pascual. It's your thank you, Bye. thank you, Nelson. Uh, I would like also to thank our supporters today, Senemi and Ashray, and also Douglas Diner, with, who is coordinating our mechanical technical committee. He's here here with us today. Uh, we do have lots of significant events coming, as Nelson said. These events are free of charge and we offer certificates upon request, so please see our website for details, yep.org.br. Well, now I would like to introduce our guest, Dr. Rao Martin Singh, who will talk about geothermal energy piles. He's a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Previously, he worked as an assistant professor at the University of Surrey, UK, and as a research fellow at Monash University, Australia. He read his PhD at Cardiff University, UK. He obtained his master in technology from IIT Delhi and has got bachelor of engineering degree from MBM Jodhpur, India. Dr. Singh has got 15 years of international experience in the area of geothermal energy pile foundations and others. His research has been awarded in the form of Best Paper Awards in 2013, 16, and 17 from prestigious international journals, including ICE. Please, Dr. Martin, directly from North Norway, give your talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, uh, for introducing me. And, and thanks, Nelson, for telling, telling us about the Institute and the activities you are doing and that inviting uh, speakers uh, on, on various uh, uh, cutting technology um, uh, topics. And so thanks very much uh, for inviting me. I'm uh, very delighted to be here. And uh, though this is online, but uh, one day hopefully to come there and, <laughs> and give the presentation in person. 
I have been to Brazil in the past and uh, I have been mainly visiting USP and uh, I have a very good friend, Christina, who is also here and she works at USP and she has been working in this research field. So this is not new to Brazil, but uh, it seems uh, Rodrigo was saying that it is only research at this moment and it's not been implemented in, in, uh, in projects. So, uh, so that would be the next phase for, for Brazil to actually utilize this, uh, this technology. Um, Rodrigo has already introduced myself. So yes, I'm a professor of geotechnical engineering in Norway at NTNU. And I have been here now for one year and few months. And uh, before that I was in the UK and originally I come from India. So let's start the presentation. Um, so just the overview for the presentation, I will be talking about uh, basically how does this technology work? What is the important component of this technology is called uh, basically heat pump. It's a heat pump based technology. And this is a very, very important part. But as a geotechnical engineer, we are not keen into this because this is a mechanical part. What we are interested in is, is, is uh, we are interested in the ground and, and the pile foundation itself. How does it perform when we heat and cool and uh, what happens to the ground? So I will be presenting a case study on that, uh, the work we carried out to show whether you know, this technology is viable or not. And then uh, I will be providing some examples as well where this technology has been used, especially in Europe a lot, it's been, it's been used. And I think it's time that Brazil also implement this in, in, in live projects. Um, but I'm sure Christina will shed more light at the end uh, about the projects. Um, yeah. So why do we need such a technology? So there is a reason when we do some, some research or you know, um, we don't do anything without any reason. And the reason here is uh, that uh, uh, we uh, use a lot of uh, um, gas for heating in Europe. Uh, Europe is uh, mainly cold climate, um, summers are short. So, but of course, depending upon which part of Europe, if you are in South is uh, not that cold, but the central part and North part is very cold. And mainly uh, climate is, uh, you know, that they rely on heating, which is based on gas. So they use gas for heating and and here you see this number that every house is responsible for 20 to 20,000 kilogram of greenhouse gas due to this, every individual house. Uh, and if you look at this pie chart, you see here that uh, this is for a normal average house uh, that for heating and cooling about 53% and for hot water 20% 20, 20%. if you add these two numbers this becomes 73, so around 75%. So three fourths of the energy bill of a house is spent on heating and hot water. I will say cooling is negligible, so it's mainly heating and hot water, which is a big bill. And uh, of course, uh, it, uh, the, when we use gas, it's not a clean fuel. It's uh, possibly people sell it that it is better than uh, oil, but still it is not not a good fuel. It causes uh, greenhouse gas emission. Now the conventional heating and cooling systems, they are not very efficient. So generally we use boilers here for heating and uh, the efficiency varies uh, between 50 to 80%. When you buy at the beginning, it's uh, quite high. It can be even more than 80%, but with time it decreases. And uh, in Europe now they are uh, imposing carbon tax. So, um, so energy is getting more expensive and that's why uh, we are looking at other alternatives, mainly renewable. So, so that's the basically uh, reason that we are doing such a research and looking at renewable energy sources for heating uh, our buildings. Um, whether this concept is new, uh, I wouldn't say that this concept is new. Our ancestors, they were very, very intelligent, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, and they knew very well that uh, the ground remains at a uh, stable temperature throughout the year. And that's why they built caves and underground uh, you know, houses, as you can see in the photos here, caves, and this is a house. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and people people stayed there and because they knew that it remains uh, same temperature throughout the year doesn't matter what is the temperature outside now this is a hotel in in uh, australia in south australia uh, not far from adelaide and here the temperature in australia is mainly desert you know 90% and uh, is where it gets very hot so temperature can go up to 50 degrees celsius but this hotel which is built underground it works without any artificial air conditioning and um, so if we want to and then this is the another photo of a uh, wine cellar as we know to produce good wine we need a stable temperature so it's a very well known fact that the temperature is stable throughout the year um, in the ground and and changes happen just possibly first 2 uh, meters or 4 meters which is a function of air temperature but as you go deeper it gets uh, quite a stable i i will show you some results to um, to yeah so how does it work this technology uh, what do we need of course we need a ground and we need heat exchanging loops which are shown here in the photos you can see the loops can be placed uh, horizontally Uh, they can be placed vertically and and uh, in horizontally as well they can be placed as u shape they are called u loop here is also u loop u shape but they can be put as as a coil as well helical so this is a helical type uh, configuration in this case you get more uh, length of uh, heat exchanger loop so you can get more energy so that's why it is used rather than using uh, straight u loop and uh, these loops are basically made up of plastic pipes and they are high density polyethylene so this is a normal pipe we use in in our houses uh, for plumbing and uh, this uh, these loops are filled with uh, fluid and fluid is water or water plus ethylene glycol water if the temperature doesn't fall below zero then water can be utilized so like in case of uh, australia uh, in most of the places it doesn't fall below zero so water can be utilized but if you go to another state called tasmania which is very very south there it can get colder but if it is a uh, you know temperature falls below zero then we need to mix antifreeze like we have in cars uh, so this needs to be mixed and generally it is about 5% um, that is industry uses and the type of loops as shown here horizontal loop vertical loop it depends upon the space we have if we have lot of space we go for horizontal loops so if we live in countryside or if we have uh, let's say university where we have a uh, field a sports field so that can be utilized to put the loops because we have a space but if we live in city uh, in the center of the city we, we don't have much space then we need to go vertically down this is a cheaper option because we don't need to drill so deep in this case we go up to 100 meter deep so that's why it is more expensive now the configuration how do we put the loops so these are the various types of configuration can be used in a in a trench for this is for horizontal loop so only you know one loop here two loops here three loops and then vertically placed here it was horizontally placed here vertically placed and then slinky type which is a helical type so there are various configuration configurations used uh, by industry And, and and this is very very popular slinky one helical one because you get more length more heat exchange uh vertical loops they can be placed uh, as a u loop uh, as i shown earlier on in the picture but they can also be put radially and in the radial direction and so uh, nowadays we have drilling available so we don't need to go vertically down we can go radial direction and in this case we can put more uh, loops from one place so rather than doing lot of bore holes from one place we can go in uh, in in radial direction in in, in uh, you can say across so we can get uh, more loops um, so yeah and uh, generally when you go for uh, vertical bore hole generally it is used one loop sometimes two loops can be utilized uh, but mostly it is one loop if two loops are utilized two loops you put it in a bore hole then you need to make sure that there is no short circuit so that loop should not touch each other uh another option is that if uh, we have a high water table then we can use uh, the water directly 
So just, you know, here you got a pipe, you get the water in and here water out. So you get the energy and then you release the water. But this system is uh, uh, very regulated and it depends upon countries and within countries it depends upon uh, municipal corporations. Some will allow this type of system, some will not allow. Like in Germany, they are against this system because they, they are worried that when you take the water out, it may be contaminated. Now it's your job to remove those contaminants. You cannot put the water back. Or they are also worried that when the water is going in, something may happen here and that may cause the pollution. So you cannot put the water back. So some countries, they don't allow this kind of system, but some countries they allow, so yeah. Uh, another type of system is uh, this uh, lake or pond. So if you have a house near a lake or a pond or river or sea, even uh, loops can be placed there. And, and it's a very low cost system because no drilling, nothing, you know, just putting the loops and loops are not very expensive. These are plastic pipes. They are very, very cheap. So this is a very, very cheap system. So if you live near a water body that can be utilized uh, as, and, and water works at the same way as the ground. So water temperature after two, three meter, it remains same. You know, it doesn't change throughout the year. Uh, the very important component is a heat pump, which is a mechanical part. Civil engineers or geotechnical engineers, we don't need to worry much about it. So if you uh, designing such a um, uh, project, uh, you will have uh, uh, this information provided by mechanical engineers. So they will do this job. But how does this heat pump work? Heat pump is like a refrigerator in our house. So if you, you know, uh, refrigerator, if you, everyone has refrigerator, and how does the refrigerator work? In, in, in a refrigerator, there are coils uh, inside. And uh, what happens is that um, uh, the heating is taken out from inside the fridge and put it at the back side. So I don't know whether you have noticed, but if you have not noticed, go today home and just check the back of the fridge and you will see it is very warm there. So all the heat from the inside of a fridge is collected and put it on the back side, and that's why freeze is colder. So it works the same way. So these are the loops, they are in the ground, and here you take the heat from the ground and supply it to for, uh, for building, for heating, and also hot water. So it can do both things. And the heat pump looks like a, this type, uh, this size, basically our washing machine or dishwasher, same size. So it's not very big, it's very easy to put it in a house and you can keep it inside. And this is a different cycle. So cooling cycle where you collect the heat. So if in the summer, what you do is that you collect the heat from the building and then you put it in the ground. You can also use this heat, which is placed in the ground in winter time. So it's a very good system if you do both heating and cooling, so you get very good efficiency. But if you do only one thing, then you need to be careful that you don't exhaust the system. So you need to allow uh, system to recharge. Some examples of this uh, technology, um, which is here in the, so I was working in the UK, so I've got examples from the UK. And this is a police headquarter in Gloucester. And they are using vertical uh, loops, closed loop, borehole, 150 boreholes going up to 100 meter deep, almost. As I said, generally you can go up to 100 meter deep and deeper than that as well. You can go up to 200 meter deep, depending upon the local geology, if it is possible to drill, if it is not expensive. So you need to look at that. If you hit the rock, then possibly it will be expensive. So then, uh, yeah, so you need to actually, you know, it's a trade off, you know, uh, between the depth and the drilling, you know, how deep you want to go. And this system was installed in 2005 and it works very fine. You know, it has a good amount of energy saving and, and also uh, in terms of money as well, it saves. Uh, another example, this is a, in, in Scotland and uh, in Aberdeen. This is Robert Gordon University. And they are using the vertical closed loop, again, boreholes, but look here, they went up to 202 meter deep. So very, and, and they went into rock. Here is a granite rock. So they must have spent a lot of money on drilling, but of course they, they saw the benefit 
because they are getting a uh, high amount of uh, heating and cooling they are doing both and 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 and, and if a system is very large you can re uh, you can recover your uh, uh, investment in 5 to 7 years time so if it's a very big system it's very easy to recover your investment very quickly uh, this is another system where the lake has been utilized it's in nottingham and uh, it's a closed loop system so the plastic loops have been placed in this lake and the uh, you know it's been used for heating and cooling both it's a very big system earlier system was in kilowatt this one is in megawatt is the biggest system in europe and it has been operating from 2011 so it's been now 10 years and in terms of saving you can see 1700 tons of carbon saving which is almost equivalent to removing 600 cars off the road so very very you know it reduces carbon emission drastically of course you have uh, monetary saving as well so uh, what happens is that uh, you basically hitting two birds with one stone so you reducing the carbon emission and also saving money as well so you hit both targets uh this is another uh, example this is using sea uh, this uh, this is a mansion or a castle you can say is next to a sea and the sea water is being utilized here and this building was actually is very far away so they don't have any electricity and uh, so they were using oil for heating and they were using 1500 liters of oil for uh, keeping this uh, you know mansion warm so such a you know i will say it's so so bad to use so much oil you know so they decided to go for this type of technology and they put open loop and and then of course they started to save and it cost about uh, 600000 and saving is 40 so you can see over the time you know 10 years or 15 years they can save um, the money they have invested this is another system uh, this is uh, in surrey and um, this is basically it's a uh, it's a utilizing the river and it's a open loop system so similar to the other examples i presented so it's, it's the similar one so it's utilizing the river water now here i am presenting some examples uh, these are from australia and these are just examples of uh, you know uh, this uh, type of systems and showing the maintenance because people ask okay okay the is uh, what about the maintenance once we install such a system how much money we need to invest you know in 5 years 10 years or 20 years and here you see this system was installed in adelaide in 1995 until now they have spent only you know 400 uh, pound each on just uh, you know all these years they needed to replace three pumps and they were not very expensive uh, and so on if you look at all these examples you see then there is almost no maintenance because what happens the system is inside inside the building so it doesn't get dusted it doesn't get uh, you know rusted because if you have ac you put it you know air conditioning you have to put the fans outside and they get you know rusted but in this case it it is inside so that's why the maintenance is very very low so the benefits are you can see here of course it's a you know uh, very sustainable way of heating and cooling and the efficiency is quite high i will come back to it uh, i should not be saying efficiency it, should, it is called coefficient of performance because nothing can be more than 100% efficient in this world because efficiency is you know output divided by input you know so it cannot be more than 100% so it's a wrong uh, term i have used but possibly i have did it intentionally just to attract your attention but it is called coefficient of performance which is basically what happens is that it's saying that if we because to run the heat pump we need to give it electricity so it runs on electricity so if we give one unit of electricity it will give us 3 to 6 units of heat or cooling energy so that what it means so it's a very good system as you can see here it it doesn't cause no maintenance no noise and um, yeah and and also uh, hotels they use it a lot it's quite popular so heat up the swimming pools and it can do both heating and cooling so that's the advantage and and hot water supply as well so very good system so this is a conventional system this has been around for many many years and now this technology has been modified to use it with pile foundation so what i am doing is that using this conventional technology and implement with pile foundations and as we know what is pile foundation is a deep foundation 
when a building load, you know, when the building is very high, very heavy, uh, uh, it needs to be supported by deep foundation. So they are called pile foundations. And if the ground is soft, say so in some cases where the building is not very big, but the ground is soft, then we need to use the piles. This is Taj Mahal. Uh, I love Taj Mahal. I will definitely suggest you to visit if you have not visited. Uh, this is, a, you know, for civil engineers, it is a must visit place. It's amazing structure. And it was built uh, 600 years ago, and it, it is built on pile foundations. And why did they build on pile foundation? Because it is next to a river, Yamuna, and they were worried about earthquake, and it's all sand. So they were worried about liquefaction, so they built it on pile foundation. How does the pile foundation work? Uh, as we know, uh, as civil engineers, that uh, pile takes the load by skin friction from the side and also from the tip. So it takes the end bearing, it is known. So end bearing and skin friction. So that's the two ways it uh, resists the load coming from the top. Uh, how the loops are placed in pile foundation. So pile foundation is basically made up of, uh, you know, it's concrete and uh, reinforcement case. So loops are placed in reinforcement cage like this. And you can see how many loops, one, two, three, four, five, six loops are placed. So it's a quite big pile. Possibly we're looking at one and a half meter pile, diameter pile. So we can put a lot of loops actually in one pile compared to uh, vertical loop where we could put only one loop. Here we can put many loops. So that's the advantage of it. So you put them in a cage and what you do, you drill a borehole and then you put this cage and fill the concrete. So it's a very, very cost-effective solution because if the building is going to rest on a pile, then we just need to put these loops and which are not very expensive. And then also it uh, saves the land. So because it's under the building, so we don't utilize more land. If you're putting vertical loops here, uh, then we need to use land. But in this case, it's under the building. So it has advantage for sure. Uh, when you come up with something new technology, always people ask questions. And, uh, and these are some of the questions uh, which I'm sure you would also have uh, and, and we ha had when we started this research. And, and the first question comes, what happened to the pile load capacity? Whether pile can take this load if you heat and cool, you know, possibly pile will collapse or, you know, if uh, pile will not collapse, what will happen to the ground, you know? Uh, whether and, and if, whether pile will expand or you know whether it will cause stresses and strain and soil deformation whether the concrete will crack so all these type of questions you know people generally ask if you tell someone you know someone who has got money and you say okay you know we can develop this you know project they will ask you these questions straight away you know tell us the answer you know so that's why you know um, that's how we started the research and we tried to answer these questions and we will try to do that in this presentation as well, some of the questions, definitely. So we did a very um, big study, and that was in Australia, uh, which was based on laboratory, field, and numerical. And today I'm just going to present some field study results, which we carried out to show whether this uh, system works or not. Um, so we wanted to work out whether the pile load capacity is affected by heating and cooling. And Pile load capacity can be determined by using this type of test where uh, there are various ways of doing it. One way is this, where you put the dead weight and the pile is somewhere in the center, which is loaded by this. Uh, this is not very popular because you can see it's, uh, health and uh, safety risk. Uh, I will no, never stand uh, close to it. <laughs> so this is not very popular, but it is still used in, in, in poor countries. Uh, this is the most popular method, which is known as reaction beam method. This is used everywhere worldwide. And uh, so you have a test pile and then you have anchor piles. And this is a hydraulic jack. So you push it against this beam and, and this pushes this test pile in the ground. So you can get the settlement versus load graph. Uh, the only disadvantage with this is that because we put anchor piles, it changes the ground around, around this test pile because it uh, densifies the ground. So that affects uh, the result, but there are empirical formulae which uh, takes this effect into account. Another type of test is known as dynamic test where pile is sitting there and then you just drop the weight. This is very popular in Australia, but not in Europe. Um, I don't know whether it's in Brazil, possibly Christina can tell us later on. I think yes, we, we, yeah, you I'm do sorry. that. 
Yes, we do that. Yes, it's called okay. PDA here. Yes. Uh -huh. So this is a dynamic test where you drop the weight on a pile and get the pile capacity. Um, but what we decided was we didn't want to do any of these tests and we came up with another idea which has been around for a while and it is known as Osterberg cell test, which is basically a load cell. So what we do is that we put the cell at the base of a pile and then we expand it. And so we get the friction capacity and we also get the end bearing. So this is a kind of a sacrificial uh, cell. So once you have done the test, this remains in the ground. You cannot take it out. But the advantage is that it gives you skin friction as well as end bearing separately. So both values, you get it. So we decided to go for this option. And uh, the pile was very well instrumented in, in, in this case. We had a lot of uh, strain gauges to measure vertical and radial strain, temperatures, uh, thermal sensors. We had pile displacement measured by LVDT's displacement sensors. And we used thermocouples in the soil to measure the temperature in the ground. And this is a site uh, at Monash University. So we utilize this uh, civil engineering department is somewhere here, not far from here, so from the site. And uh, so this is the site where we, uh, you will see the photos. So this is the, um, these are the photos of, uh, of uh, the reinforcement cage. So that's how it came at the beginning. And we decided to put two load cells. So instead of putting one, we decided to put two. Because as I said, if you only put one and you open it up and that's it, you cannot use it again and again. Once it open, you cannot close it back. But this way, if you open this one, you can close this one. And then you open this one, you can close the other one. So we wanted to do this because we wanted to do a lot of number of tests. So we came, we came up with this idea, which was very, very unique. And then we, uh, you can see the loops here. We put three loops and then you got the cables for all the sensors. Pile was about 20 meter deep. So you can see the pile taken to the site after uh, instrumentation. And here you see the photos drilling going on. It's a board pile and then you place the cage and then you fill the concrete bottom up. So that's how it is done. And this is at the end uh, with the loops and the cables connected to sensors. Uh, this is the schematic. You can see various gauges, uh, strain, temperature, LVDTs, and, and these are the Osterberg cells. And, and these are the boreholes next to this pile, uh, measuring the temperature. We carried out two types of tests, short term, long term, and uh, heating test. And after every heating test, we did uh, the load capacity test. So we measured the load capacity before doing the heating and after the heating. So we did that. And uh, so I will present some results here. This is, these are the ground temperature results. This is in Melbourne, um, uh, which is south of Australia. And you can see the ground temperature here. So this is the air temperature. So in Melbourne, very, very nice. You know, it doesn't freezes. So it is always below, it is always above zero. And, but you see here, the ground temperature doesn't change much, you know? So first two meters or four meter, and then after that is more or less constant. And if you see, is 10 meter, 12 meter. And after this is completely, it's not affected by this air temperature at all. So very, very stable. Uh, this is the fluid temperature. So, and uh, inflow, input to inflow and outflow temperature. But uh, what we are interested in here is this heat flux value, which is shown here. And this heat flux, if you see, this gives us about 100 watt per meter square. So this, is, this can be used as a design, as a thumb rule. So if you have number of piles and you know the surface area, you can calculate how much energy you can get. So 100 watt per meter square is, is generally, uh, you know, can be starting point when you design such a system. So how much energy a pile can give you. Um, this is a um, um, graph showing the average fluid temperature versus time. It's a log scale. And this is on a normal, so it's a semi-log graph. And you plot that and you plot this line, which is basically linear. This is used to uh, calculate the thermal conductivity of the ground. So this is a method which is a developed based on infinite line heat source theory. So this is very much applicable to borehole where the borehole is 100 meter, 200 meter deep. But this, is, uh, this doesn't work with piles. And if you see here, the thermal conductivity we got it as 3.75, which was very, very high. And it suggests that it doesn't work with piles. So still we are looking for solutions for pile where we should not use this infinite line heat source. 
uh, theory to be able to work out the ground thermal conductivity. So there is still research to be done and Christina has done some work in this area. We have published a paper as well on that and um, possibly you can discuss that later on. Uh, these are the further results. Uh, this is this is result in, in, in the pile. So we heated up. So you can see the temperature is going up. And then when you stop heating, the temperature starts to drop and it tries to reach the, reach the original temperature. Uh, and, and what we came up, what we realized that it takes about twice the time. So let's say if we heated up, uh, uh, let's say about 58 days or 60 days here, it needs about 120 days to reach to original temperature. So that's a kind of a thumb rule can be utilized as well. So if we use a system, uh, we need to allow double the time for it to recover. Or if you want to have a less, then you can utilize this that, okay, or you know, there would be a shift in the ground temperature and you should take into account uh, when you're designing it. But the best thing would be to actually allow it to reach to its original ground temperature. So then we can get full potential of it. And this is basically showing the temperature uh, and these are at various time intervals, so thermal profiles, and it's basically same. So coming from here, uh, presented here. So you can see when you heated, you went here, and when you cooling down, it comes back here. So it uh, doesn't reach to original temperature. That's what it's showing. These are the borehole temperatures. Borehole also, so the ground temperature responded, um, but it was much lower than the pile temperature. Pile temperature was 40 degrees something. Here it was 30. Uh, which this borehole is half meter, this borehole is two meter, and this one has uh, much lower uh, temperature rise. So that also gives us idea that how far we should space the piles. Generally, five meter is uh, used by industry um, that coming from borehole uh, technology. So that's uh, they do it. But uh, if we have such results, we can actually, you know, we know uh, if you want to reduce that distance, we can do that but industry uses at this moment as five meters. So which is very, very safe because this is at two meters. So if you go five meter, there will not be any uh, temperature uh, influence, you know, from the adjoining pile. So they will not affect each other. So you can say, you know, um, yeah. So it will not affect each other if you have a distance of five meter between them. Then again, these are just the temperature profiles taken from here. And again, suggesting that uh, at the end of heating, you are here and once you start to let it cool, the temperature doesn't reach to its original temperature. That's what it's showing. And uh, yeah, so you, you can see that they would, uh, it takes time to recover the original time, uh, original ground temperature. Uh, this is the result we are very much interested in that whether the pile load capacity is affected by doing this. And you can see here, what we did was we tested the pile uh, before heating, and you see the, the pile load capacity is about 1600, 1700 kilonewton. And when we heated, and after finishing the heating, this was short term heating, nine days heating, and then we did the pile test. And this time, actually, it increased and it went up to 1950. And then, after uh, short term heating, we allowed the pile to cool down and we did again the testing and it got to original pile load capacity. And when then we did the long term heating 52 days, and then again increase and then again, same. So it suggests that when you do this, actually it doesn't affect the pile capacity. Uh, actually, in this case, we saw the increase in, uh, in the load capacity, but it depends upon the type of geology. This was because this pile was installed in sand and, and there was some moisture we suggest uh, that uh, possibly moisture, uh, you know, uh, went away from the pile. That might that might have caused this increase. But even if we don't, if we ignore this increase, and we say that the pile load capacity is not affected by doing this heating and cooling at all. Uh, these are the strain uh, measurements in the pile, and uh, from this we can work out the thermal stresses. So it depends upon the whether the pile is fixed or free and generally it is fixed at the partially fixed for sure at the top. And here it depends upon if it is a rock, it will be fixed. If it is a clay, possibly it will be uh, free to move. So, so th this uh, actually uh, the uh, strain response depends upon that. But once we know the strain response, uh, we can also work out the thermal stresses. So this is Basically, this is the strain response of this pile actual. 
and this is the is called free expansion so let's say if the pile was not restrained at all and it was free to move it will move by this amount but because we have this resistance from the soil it moves by only this amount so what happens is that this difference between this free and this uh, actual strain is the thermal stresses so we can work out this thermal stresses so you can just cut this out and then put it uh, as a you can multiply with this uh, modulus of elasticity of concrete so the difference between free expansion and actual strain multiply with e will give you the thermal stresses in concrete and which we should take into account when we design design a pile thermal pile the technology has moved so it's not only we you know it's been uh, around for a while pile uh, geothermal pile but now it's moving further now you see here we are utilizing uh, for uh, walls so these are diaphragm walls so uh, underground walls can be utilized tunnels tunnels are very popular uh, they can be utilized as well and and in this case i am saying sewers as well so sewers can be utilized Uh, to get the heat because uh, it's carrying uh, at, uh, water at higher temperatures so whatever we flush from our toilets we can get heat out of that and that could be another option uh, some case studies some examples of uh, geothermal energy piles so this is crystal uh, building is siemens office in london and this is a uh, zero uh, net zero energy building so it uses solar panels and it uses energy piles so if you visit london i will suggest you to see this building and it's open to visit and this was built in 2012 this is the heat capacity heating and cooling capacity 600 uh, kilowatt heating and cooling um, so and and showing the uh, pile foundation with loops as i showed you earlier on this is another example and uh, this is uh, new bank side london this building uses 130 geothermal piles 52 meter deep this is about 650 700 kilowatt heating and cooling system it's completed in 2011 so 10 years ago it was completed this is another building this is a hotel this is based on diaphragm uh, so not only piles also wall so in this case this is a diaphragm wall so the loops are placed in the wall as well so it, it uses both technology piles and wall completed in 2013 so quite big system 2000 kilowatt system so just to wrap up here basically is uh, um, what it, it is is that uh, i presented this already this uh, some uh, conclusions which are normal observations from this technology and that this is a very efficient and environmental friendly system and this is not my wording it is coming from international international energy agency which suggests that this is the best technology available at this moment for heating and cooling a building and uh, in terms of pile response when it comes to that it's uh, very very important that we allow it to recover if you using only one type of uh, system where we use either heating or cooling then we need to allow it to uh, reach to its original temperature otherwise the efficiency will be affected in long run but if you do both heating and cooling then you get optimum efficiency uh pile load capacity what we found was not affected by doing heating but of course we need to be careful depending upon the type of soil the soil we uh, we had it was sand and uh, thermal stresses uh, need to be taken into account when we design such a pile so depending upon the pile uh, fixity whether pile is fixed or free uh, it will have a thermal response and that needs to be taken into account or also the displacements Uh, if it is you know free to move then it will have uh, movement so that needs to be taken into account so that's it from my side uh, thank you very much for listening uh, obrigado that's the only <laughs> portuguese word i know <laughs> so uh, i know in much. spanish is called buenas noches so uh-huh. i or is it buenas tardes but you i think you call it uh, bao tardes something like yes. that yeah What are this? <laughs> so, so Dr. Martin, now let's go to the questions. Uh, the questions, please. Um, Celso de Mello, which who is uh, one of our associates, is asking: How expensive is the heat pump for an average family house? Is it viable to you to implement this in an average family house? 
Yes, very good question. Yes, it can be implemented with the average family home. And, uh, but uh, yes, it's uh, depending upon what type of loops you put, whether horizontal or vertical. If you put horizontal loops, if you live on a farm, it will be very cost effective solution and you can possibly get your money back in 10, 12 years. But if you go vertically down, then the, it's uh, expensive because drilling is quite expensive. In that case, you're looking at uh, that you will get your investment back in 20 to 25 years for a normal okay. house. But uh, nowadays, uh, people are trying district heating. So where instead of doing one house, they connect number of houses. So when you have number of houses connected with the one system, then you can recover all your money back in uh, between five to 10 years. So if the system is very large, it's much faster to recover your investment. And, and Europe is moving towards that. It's called district heating and cooling system. So instead of heating individual house, you heat number of houses. So you have a one system centralized and you heat 100 houses, 200 houses, or the whole town or the whole city you can heat up. And uh, yeah, and in Norway, we have a lot of examples of it, heating the whole city with this type of system. Okay. Uh, Claudio Higashi is asking, good afternoon, Dr. Martin. Could you talk about the importance of the efficiency of the thermal exchange, depending on the type of the soil for the operation of the energy piles? And if there is any scientific uh, article, articles or papers uh, with studies with uh, four different type of, types of soils? Yes, there is a lot. If you go to my web page, you will find we have got some review papers you can refer to them and we are reviewing all soil types, all the systems, uh, you know, various types of pile. Here I presented board pile, but the pile can be CFA, continuous flight over pile. So CFA pile can be utilized, driven piles can be utilized. Uh, so I will suggest you to go to my web page uh, or research gate and, and you can find the papers there. Uh, with regards to the uh, question whether it affects, yes, it affects depending upon the soil type and depending upon the water content. So if it's a uh, very moist soil, the heat transfer will be quicker. So it, it is very good. But if it is a very dry soil, the heat dissipation will be very, very slow. So heat will remain there. It will take longer. So, so you need to be careful, yes. Uh, what type of ground is there? How much moisture is there? And whether it is sand, whether it is clay, sand will have more thermal conductivity, so faster dissipation compared to clay. And if it is rock, much faster than sand. So geology matters and the water content matters. I understood that uh, you said that if you spend um, for one, one, one unit of energy to implement this system, you save up to three or six or four, or even six, uh, you have this efficiency. Is it is yes. that correct? Okay. Yes, it is true. So one unit of electricity to run the, the heat pump will give you three to six unit of uh, energy. And uh, generally, on average, three to four is very easy to achieve, but it can be achieved six as well. When if the system is doing both heating and cooling, then you can achieve very very high efficiency with the system. And also, Dr. Martin, I would like to tell you that there is a church here in Curitiba. I don't know if everybody knows. Someone told me some someday. Uh, there is a church here in a neighborhood called Cristo Rey, in which a 90 meter length tunnel, tunnel or duct was built to cool or heat the church. A professor here of, of our federal university is called Aloysio Schmidt. Maybe some of the attendees here know him. Um, the main principles seem to be the same, you know, the ground, the, based on the ground or the soil having lower thermal uh, conductivity in comparison to the air. So, in fact, as far as I know here in Brazil, we have, we don't have still any company selling or any constructor using these energy piles commercially. We have here Professor Cristina from USP. Uh, I think she is in, she has some advanced researches over there. Cristina, are you listening? <laughs> yes. I Could mean, you tell us a little bit about of, of about your research over there in news? In news? Uh, I, we, we, sorry, Martin. <laughs> we started to investigate energy piles in 2014. Uh, first, we did some uh, piles and the uh, heat exchanger in the soil at, at São Carlos, uh, and also Martin participate of uh, of this research. 
we have a paper together, is an unsaturated soil. So we did many tests, thermal tests, thermal mechanical tests. Né? And uh, after I, I started to participate of a new project that is six of the, at São Paulo, of the USP at São Paulo, né? a Escola Politécnica, that is a building uh, that should be constructed for testing sustainable technologies. Né? So we did the foundation in 2019, uh, is a CFA pails and uh, pipe pails of Tuper, that is a, a company in Santa Catarina, né? is a pipe piles, steel pipe piles, and we installed uh, geothermal pipes, né? uh, heat exchanger pipes inside the, uh, the, pipe, the steel pipe, uh, piles and inside CFA piles. Né? And uh, the foundation is okay, we did many tests, thermal response tests for both, né? uh, but the, the construction of the building stopped <laughs> due to the pandemic, the COVID. And we, we, we the started to construct the, the building after the foundation, but it stopped. And we are waiting. Né? The, the end of the COVID because the university is closed, it's still closed. I don't know in Paraná, I think it's the same, né? the universities are closed to continue. And in this project, we are monitoring the soil temperature, the uh, load in the piles, uh, and many, many points of the building. We have many monitoration to do. And they also we have a monitoration inside the rooms. Né? because I cooperate with another professor, uh, Alberto Hernandes da Poli, of Poli, that is a uh, conditioning air, uh, his specialty, né? and he will monitoring the, the building, the, the efficiency. Uh, he's, he, he did the project of the heat pump, etc. So my part is the uh, below the, <laughs> the ground, né? is the piles, né? is getting the energy for the, the building. But we have uh, uh, there two theses. And uh, the first thesis was of Thais. Thais is watching today, is also here. Uh, Martin, she, she visited Martin in, in UK. Né? <laughs> uh, she did the pile in São Carlos. Né? So we are doing tests since 2014 in energy piles. Né? This is our experience and uh, we got uh, good numbers and some uh, idea né, about the, the heat exchanger capacity, né, the height of heat exchanger. So this is the nice. history. And Martin visited us two times. It was very a uh, pleasure to, to receive him uh, at the university. I hope that after COVID he can come again. <laughs> yeah, yeah maybe, maybe we could do something together. USP uh, and EF, maybe. Um, Dr. Martin, oh, I, Alberto, that... Alberto Hernandez here too. Yeah. My colleague yeah. that is working. Maybe you could ask, uh, ask him to you know to talk. Uh -huh. Nice. Let, let's let's just. There, there is another question here, Dr. Martin. Okay. Just a moment. Uh, okay. Is there any any local government incentive for for the use of this system of heating and cooling over there in in Norway? What did he say? Say it again. I Is there any hear. local government incentive in terms of financial? Ah, yeah. yeah. Yes, it's a very good question. And I think that's the reason in Brazil as well. Possibly, yes, Christina has been doing research since 2014. And, uh, and the project uh, she, she mentioned in uh, USP in Sao Paulo, which is the actually live project because it's part of a, of a building. So that's the first project, you know, live project. But she has been doing research in Sao Carlos in uh, from since 2014, and uh, so definitely you need some incentives for such technology because uh, at the beginning it is it's, it's a bit expensive. So if there is no incentive, people wouldn't do it, and even it's not the cost uh, because now the cost is uh, in in this case cost is not doesn't matter because you can recover the cost in you know. If the system is very big between five to 10 years, you can recover as I presented the case studies. So cost is not the reason. If people have good intention, they can implement it. If the system is big, it is you recover the money. But uh, what happens is that if there is no incentive, uh, nobody wants to do it. 
you know, the contractors will say, why should I, you know, worry about it? I know I do this job every day. This way I construct my pile. I know it works. I don't want to put loops. Why should I put loops? Unless there is a government incentive, incentive government says, okay, if you put this, if you use renewable technology, we will give you more money or we will, you know, then only they will do it. So that's why with such tech, with any renewable technology, you need to have incentive. Otherwise people do it in the always old ways. And civil engineering industry is the oldest industry and is still working in the same ways it used to work 100 years ago. No much change, you know. Now we are talking about digitalization and these things that we should improve, but still we are very, very far behind, you know, compared to other engineering. They are there, you know, implementing new technologies. But in civil engineering, we still do the same thing about 100 years ago, you know, same concrete, same reinforcement, you know, no change in material, no. So we need to move on, definitely. And, and it can happen only if there is a government incentive. Incentive in, in the UK, there is uh, any new building uh, in the UK, especially in London uh, municipality, uh, that uh, has to have 10% uh, energy coming from renewable energy sources. So this is a condition. So contractors have to meet this condition. And, and this is the best way to meet uh, using uh, geothermal energy. And it's very easy to get 10%. Because it can be still quite big number if you have, if you have a very large building you may not get only with solar panels people think oh we can get it it may not be enough and then in that case you have to use your so London in most of the buildings there they use geothermal pile most of the buildings and now they have made this rule that from 2025 any new building will not use gas heating no gas heating at all any new construction in the UK from 2025, no gas heating. So then they have to use this technology. They don't have any other option. Unless we make the electricity completely renewable, like in the case of Norway. Norway, uh, most of the electricity comes from renewable. Uh, it's hydropower like, uh, like in Brazil. So 100% is from hydro. But with this system, even it's renewable, it's, uh, you know, the, it, uh, the electricity is 100% uh, you know, renewable. But still, this system gives you so much efficiency that you can save the electricity and you can decrease the load. So even you know somebody say, oh, we have got electricity coming for hydropower. We don't need to worry about this technology. No, you can save more energy because in future we need electric cars. We our energy demand will increase, and that the peak time, if we can reduce the peak demand by using such a technology, we should use it. Okay. There is a last question here. Uh... Charles Chavez is asking, could you talk more about the analytical method of interpretation of the infinity line source and the cylindrical method? Did you use the, uh, both methods to compare? Yes, we did later on, but this was in, at the beginning. So, so I wanted to show that we use cylindrical one and, and that improved the results. So you need to use the appropriate method. Uh, yeah. Okay. So our time is, is ending right now. Uh, as, as we were uh, talking a little bit uh, earlier, uh, before the talking, uh, I do think uh, the system can be used here. Here in South Brazil, we have some similar climate conditions to what you have in other temperate climate uh, conditions in other places in the world. Uh, despite the differences in terms of soil conditions. So we are very pleased to have you here today, Dr. Mata. Maybe it could encourage someone to implement this technology here. This video was recorded and it will be, will be available in the app channel in YouTube. Uh, thank you again very much. And uh, I would like to invite everyone to be tuned and to see our website for details, eap.org.br where all these events are being uh, put. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Congratulations, Professor Ralph.